this in there very well. It does fully integrate with uh, with Windchill and, and PTC's PLM systems. <coughs> and one of the really neat things about Create Illustrate is it does allow you to use uh, competitors' CAD data. So if you're, let's say, you're using Katia, um, or you've got, uh, you know. Inventor or AutoCAD, and there's a few other ones as well as uh, you know the, the CAD neutral formats. Those are also uh, usable directly in in uh, Creo Illustrate, and that's because it's it's based off of the uh, the Creo View platform. So uh, you'll notice a lot of similarities between Creo View and, and Creo Illustrate. Um, one of the benefits there is that we can just bring in native uh, you know competitor CAD data, and so. What are why would someone use this? What are the, the traditional uh, you know things that people would use this for? Uh, the the number one first and foremost is to clearly convey complex information. So I've got a, a mechanism or I've got a design where I want to uh, to show something uh, in exploded view, or I want to show kind of the design intent, or maybe service information on how this components these components are assembled or disassembled. Um, I can create those very easily. Uh, the 3D animation tool in Creo Illustrate is very nice and very easy to use. Um, you can improve service and part accuracy. So uh, traditionally, when I'm bringing information in from, let's say, Pro Engineer, I've done a lot of CAD work. Um, and this next one here as well, quickly generate service documentation. I've done a lot of CAD work, um, creating service uh, manuals and sorts of those sorts of things using screenshots from Pro E. And it can be a little bit frustrating at times. You'll find that Creo Illustrate does simplify um, the, the creation of these uh, tools and allow us to uh, improve the, just the accuracy of, of quickly and easily placing parts into these, these uh, tech, technical documentation uh, types. And uh, again, number four here, increase Illustrator productivity. Because it is kind of streamlined and designed for the, uh, the Illustrator, Instead of for the uh, design engineer, it does have uh, some simplified functionality. When I'm creating exploded views, when I'm creating uh, you know cross-sectional cuts, I don't need to parametrically define them. I can just move them until they look uh, like what I'm expecting them to look like. And some of the uh, the nicer dynamic cross-sectioning capabilities that that we're seeing trickle down into uh, Creo uh, Parametric now, some of those were available first in Creo Illustrate. And uh, one of the, uh, the the key benefits of, of uh, Creo Illustrate is it does allow you to choose whether or not you want to maintain a link to those uh, those original CAD files. Uh, why would you want to do that? Well, that allows me to to uh, have my illustrations automatically update when the uh, when the engineer decides to go back and change the assembly to change parts in the assembly. I will notice my technical illustrations um, can actually update depending on on the settings that I choose. Now, in some cases, you don't necessarily want that to uh, to be the case. So you'll find that that is that is why it is an option. So if somebody updates a bolt from an, an M5 to an M6 bolt, uh, that's not really going to change the uh, the design uh, functionality of of the uh, of the assembly. It's not going to change most of the technical illustrations. So you might want some of your technical illustrations not to have to to update in those circumstances. So where can I use it? And as you can see from this slide. It's more probably uh, appropriate to ask where can I not use it, and you can pretty much use it just about anywhere. Now it's it's geared really towards uh, technical documentation, whether that's training or that's uh, you know service manuals, <coughs> whether that's uh, things that things that go into uh, uh, support information. You'll see that uh, the, the the range of places you can use this is pretty broad. So uh, I get asked occasionally, you know. Uh, you know what's new? That's that's something that I usually get asked at all my all our user group meetings and and uh, you know when we go out and and uh, do update uh, pitches for for companies, they ask, well, you know, what's new? Why should I update if I'm already using Creo, Creo Illustrate one? Why should I go to Creo Illustrate two? And uh, there's this is just a few of the items in the list. Some of the ones that I've found to be the most useful. There are many more than this, but uh, I have the ability to create construction geometry and, and figures now very easily. I can cap section cuts for non-solid parts. So when I've got those parts and assemblies where I'm, I'm uh, using kind of a lightweight part or I'm using something that maybe isn't completely solidified, um, I can treat it and make it behave as if it was a solid part. And you'll see uh, an example of that in, in the demonstration here in a little bit. 
I have the ability now to, to take measurements of parts and figures. So when I need to, to show an illustration showing that there's a certain uh, number of inches of clearance between two components, I can very easily do that now. We have some, some new options for protecting intellectual property in our published illustrations. Uh, we have um, a, a feature that I find to be very, uh, very effective, uh, how to, a, a, the ability to recover illustrations from automatically saved files. So if you're, if you're doing like I frequently do, and you're pushing the software a little bit harder than you necessarily should, and maybe you, uh, you know, or maybe I, I forget to save something and I, I uh, force a, a restart on my machine or my machine comes unplugged or the power goes out, those sorts of things. Um, Creo Illustrate behaves kind of like Microsoft Word does, where it's automatically saving files as you go along. So that way, when the, the power comes back on and you get your computer booted back up again, uh, if I hadn't saved in several hours, I should still have that information, uh, you know, something relatively reasonably uh, close to my, my last known uh, point should be, should be saved, which is very, very helpful. I've used that um, several times already. Uh, then another thing that they've added is the ability to route explode lines through intermediate parts. So I no longer have to make sure that things stay kind of linearly aligned, you know, with the axis of the original part. If I'm exploding things not in just one direction, but in multiple directions, I can very easily put those jogs and, and put those intermediate uh, parts, the explode, explode lines through those intermediate parts. We also have the ability to use companion XML files to help set up illustrations automatically. So if you're, if you're doing the same types of illustrations for several different configurations of parts, you know, maybe I'm going to have an exploded view, then I'm going to have a cross-section view, and then I'm going to have you know, my bomb um, balloons showing on, on a, a figure, and I'm, I'm going to be doing the exact same format on several parts. Um, then I can use these companion XML files to kind of, like using a template for a drawing in, in Pro Engineer or in Creo Parametric, to kind of do a lot of that, that upfront work for me, the, those companion XML files will, uh, will do that for me as well. Then my favorite feature about Creo Illustrate, I should have put this one at the top, the ability to set the spin center. If you're like me and you come from Creo Parametric and Pro Engineer uh, background, you'll, you'll see that the, uh, the Creo View orientation can be a little frustrating at times just because it's a little bit different than what we're used to in Pro-E. When I'm spinning parts around, it seems like they don't typically get that spin center like we're used to. Well, now I've got a couple clicks of the mouse where I can easily go in and, and set my spin center um, exactly to the, the point that I want to set it to. Or I can automatically set the spin center, which will give me roughly the, the center of the part. And another really nice one, adjusting cross sections with draggers. I know the, uh, the I got a few complaints about the cross-sectional functionality in Creo, or on Creo Illustrate 1.0 that uh, it just wasn't intuitive holding shift and control and dragging to spin around certain axes. Uh, you'll notice it is much easier to do now. So now what you guys are all here to actually see, let's actually go in and, and uh, play around with the software itself. So I've got, first of all, just a, a pretty large assembly loaded here, and you know, those of you that I've seen our advanced assembly extension webinars. You'll probably recognize this lawnmower. Um, I have already imported this in because the import took you know 30, 45 seconds, and that's valuable webinar time. Um, but you'll notice it actually looks pretty good. I can spin it around. Um, I brought some of the components in, but not all of them. So you'll notice in my my S bomb over here. Uh, my service bill of materials, that not all of the components are checked. You know, certain things like skeleton parts. You know, I don't necessarily want to show those. You know, you can see here my skeleton parts. Uh, I don't necessarily want to show those in my, uh, in my training materials because they just really don't make sense. Uh, you know, a theoretical skeleton part doesn't make any sense for a, uh, a you know, service tech. They don't, they don't need to see that information. Uh, one of the really cool things about Creo Illustrate is it allows me to very quickly and easily go into uh, an assembly and create several different figures of this assembly. So, you know, typically uh, in, in Pro-E, I would go in and I would orient to maybe this orientation and then I would save a screenshot. And then I would go in and, and you know, maybe change it to another orientation and change the display style, zoom in on something, save another screenshot. Well, here, if you notice on the left, I've already created four figures. Uh, one, three, four, and five. Number two got deleted. I didn't like the way it looked. Um, but as I start orienting these around, you can see I just updated figure one. I'll zoom in nice and tight, and you'll see, um, you know, I zoom in nice and tight on the seat. You'll see my preview shows a nice tight zoom in on the seat. 
but I want to show you a couple of really neat little things of, about the software here. We want to first go in and I want to show you all the different display styles. So that, those are all located under rendering modes and you'll notice I have eight rendering modes and technically I have more than that because I also now have a, a thick and thin option so um, that doesn't really apply with shaded but I'll show you what that looks like with the other examples. So we've got a shaded view, we've got shaded with edges and this will take just a second to render because there are quite a few edges in this model. There we go. Notice how some of the information comes in but you're not seeing all of those necessarily, all, all those little tangent edges. Um, if I uncheck the thick thin option you'll see I see all of the edges of the entire part, all of the uh, little every single surface on that tire now has, has the uh, wireframe edges showing. So that's one of the benefits of the new thick and thin option there. Now that tire looks a little more realistic. We've also got flat shaded with edges. Then we've got um, cell illustration. We've got HLR and this is what you traditionally would think of when you think of a uh, you know technical documentation. This would be the black and white lines. Notice here also the thick and thin option uh, does give us a lot more. You know, if I uncheck that box, I can see a lot more of the edges. That's not necessarily always needed, however. Then we've also got colored HLR. In this case, I get the, the colors from the model. So if, if I've got a red component, the, the lines will show up as red instead of black. Then I've also got shaded illustration and white shaded illustration. So uh, a variety of different methods to, to look at those parts, um, you know, from, you know, we, we see people that have a, a completely different concept of what would what should appear on technical documentation. Shaded views or wireframe or, you know, uh, no hidden line or hidden line removed, you know, we get we get a lot of, uh, of variety and we have a lot of variety as to what we can apply to this. Also we have uh, orthographic and perspective view orientations. We notice here, let me zoom out here. The perspective gives me a nice, you know, if I, I want to zoom in on something on the front and take a measurement across these two wheels, that gives me a very nice view orientation to do that. Whereas orthographic gives you a more traditional uh, 3D CAD approach. Now, I can come in and I can change these around. I, uh, the, the ultimate goal here is I want to show this assembly in several different view orientations or several different um, display styles. So in my tech, technical documentation, whether that's an owner's manual or whether that's a, uh, a service manual, I'm going to have lots of figures that I'm going to refer back to. So uh, first of all, let's say, let's toggle over to figure three and you can see uh, this saved a view state, you know, a zoom level. It also saved a, a, a HLR mode with, you know, thick slash thin edges. Uh, maybe I've got another view orientation that I want to set, you know, looking at the bottom of the deck of the model. Very, very simple, very easy. If I want to create another view, I can do this in a variety of different ways. I can come in, I can pick new figure and insert a blank figure. I personally prefer to start with something like this and right click duplicate. That saves a copy of my figure. And maybe this time I'm going to say instead of, uh, you know, figure four, let's actually rename this one to top view. And while I'm in here, let's actually go in and let's give it a, an orientation. So let's actually pick that top view. So I can see exactly what that's going to look like from the top. One other thing I'd like to show you is our cross-sectioning capabilities. So if you've noticed here, I've got a, a cross-sectional state of my, of my model. I've got it cut in two places. Let me just recreate this by grabbing figure one and duplicating figure one. Down here at the bottom, I'm going to take this copy of figure one and start doing my cross-sectioning on this. So I'm going to, as you would expect, go to my sectioning tab. And first I'm going to click uh, show section and it's going to give me a, a default section here. When I click on that section, you'll notice I get three directional draggers. So I can move it in the X, the Y, or the Z direction. So in this case, I'm dragging that Z vector, the blue vector. And you can see as I drag through the part, I get a very nice dynamically updating preview of the parts. Now this is what I, I told you about earlier. Notice this cap section. When I uncheck this button, you'll notice that a lot of the, uh, the components in this part are, are showing as being hollow. Now some of these actually are hollow, like if I zoom in on this molded plastic component, it is actually hollow. You'll see a wall thickness there. But some of these components, when I click cap section, if you notice the seat now is appearing 
as solid, even though technically the model associated with that seat is actually hollow. So let me uncheck that cap section. You'll notice that it's actually, I can see the, the back side of that inner surface there. That's something that wasn't available before. Now at this point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one of the neater things. That, like I said, my favorite thing. When I'm, when, I'm moving this, uh, when I'm moving this model around, and I'm dragging my cross sections through this model, as I'm spinning it around, it's not really spinning in a way that I would consider predictable from my, my Pro E experience. So if I go under the Home tab, I'll see the Spin Center is, is here. I can check Automatic Spin Center, and with that box checked, now when I rotate my model, I'll see that it rotates more like a traditional Pro E uh, reorientation uh, that we're, like we're used to. So I'm going to leave that set to, to on. And let's go in and let's, let's make our cross section a little more complicated here. <coughs> so instead of a, a standard planar cut, maybe I need to pick which direction that's cut about. So we've got our X axis, we've got our Y axis, and we've got our Z axis um, cross sectional cuts. Let's go back to that first x-axis cut. Maybe I want to show the other side of the x-axis. The way I'm going to modify a, a sectional cut is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to expand out this little arrow in the setup. And I'm going to go into here, I, I do planar or quarter cut, you know, whether or not I cap my section and show my boundaries, all those options are there, just like clicking the buttons in the, uh, in the ribbon. I'm going to click cut one, and let's drag this over here to the side. And I can change my orientation. Let's say, for example, I want to flip to the other side of, of my, uh, my cross-section cut. Or maybe I want to rotate around the X, the Y, or the Z axis. Or I want to move it translationally along the axis a certain, uh, certain distance. I can also do what we call a quarter cut. When I click quarter cut, notice my second plane pops in here. And now when I go in under the setup, I'll see I have tabs for cut one and cut two. So in this case, I can flip the direction of cut two individually from flipping the direction of cut one, just like you would expect. When I pick these, these planes, I've got my draggers where I can dynamically drag along, along here. I can also choose which components are going to be intersected. So let's say, for example, um, I just wanted to show um, the tire being cut. So let's, let's grab our other plane over here and let's drag this over so that I'm just cutting the tire. And I don't want to show any of the other components being cut. I'm going to first uncheck Intersect with All, and then I'm going to pick just the tire and click Add Selected. Now notice the cut is only cutting the tire. Maybe I want to add the wheel in as well, so I pick the wheel and Add Selected again. Now notice my, my plane gets smaller to indicate I'm just cutting a, a small portion of the model. And notice I can drag each of these independently to give me a nice, a nice view. So if I want to look at something specifically on the wheel now, I've got my figure one here. You know, and I can rename this, right click, rename, we'll call this wheel cross section. So let's, let's get into some of the other functionality of the software. Let's go back up to figure one and play around with this one again. Um, like I mentioned before, under the Tools tab, here's where I've got the ability to do those things like uh, measure distances, um, add construction geometry, whether those are points, axes, planes, coordinate system curves, or lines. So traditionally you would think construction uh, geometry as being just points, axes, planes, and coordinate systems, but I can do curves and lines as well. I can measure distance, diameter, or angle, or radius as well. Let's say, for example, I want to pick the distance between these, these, uh, these two front wheels here. So I'm going to measure distance. And first, I'm going to pick the component. And then I'm going to pick, let's say, the outer face of the component. Then I'm going to pick two. I'm going to pick the other component. and Rotate this around and pick the outer face of this other component. And I'll see immediately. It tells me 1,221.325 millimeters between those. So maybe I want to drag this around and put it in a location that, that looks nice and pretty, and then I want to you know, save my figure at that point. So notice when I click the figure, it does update to whatever I recently have uh, modified the figure to be. 
Because of that, I traditionally, just a little, little tip for those of you that do use the software, I typically leave, in this case I messed it up, but I usually leave one figure at the top that's kind of uh, you know, my starting point, a nice isometric view that I can, I can always duplicate from that and, and modify that very quickly and easily. Uh, one of the other benefits, and, and I won't show you how to do this, but uh, it, one of the other things I can do when I add, let's say, for example, a construction axis, I can then go in and when I'm moving things to show animations, I can rotate things around my construction axis so I can, I can define my construction axis as the um, point of, of revolution of a component. So if I didn't have a full assembly, maybe I'm only working with certain components in the assembly, uh, that makes it very nice and easy to, to go in and and uh, and not have to worry about bringing in the uh, you know constraints and mechanism type things from Pro E or from even uh, CAD other CAD packages. I can just tell it I want to rotate around this specific axis that I specify. Now I want to go in here and I want to actually um, I want to I want to open up a different file. I'm going to let's not save this one. Let's go under a uh, oops that was the wrong one. I just opened the same file again. Let me open. Um, another folder here and notice when I open this I get a notification telling me that something about this model has changed so in this case this part has been linked to the original uh, you know, this drill body ASM uh, assembly has been linked to the original CAD file so somebody has modified the original CAD file and at this point I can tell it I want to if I check the box and click OK it will update all of my drawings to reflect that change as well if I uncheck the box it will not update. So let's go ahead and let this one update. And this is a, a slightly simpler example. Um, I got some good advice from one of the other CDT engineers a long time ago when I first started. Um, try not to bite off too big of a chunk with demos because if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Uh, so I, I want to you know, show you some of the more advanced functionality like uh, animations on a, a much simpler component that has a lot fewer pieces. Now, I, I want to just start off by saying I uh, set a stopwatch yesterday, and I started on this, and I gave myself one hour. So these five figures you see over here on the left, some of them are very simple and easy, um, but the animations and the exploded view, I did all of this in one hour. Just I like doing that in the demos to, just to show what kind of functionality you can expect to get. And, uh, you know, I'm not the most uh, impressively fast at the software, but uh, that way you'll know just about how fast um, you can create some things with with little or, or uh, you know moderate training. So I've got five figures. First is just a, a standard isometric figure. Then I created a cross section figure where I took a, a cross section cut and I dropped some bomb balloons on here. I'm then creating an animation of the uh, kind of a service animation of of the part of the assembly. Then I created an assembly animation, which I basically started by taking my my uh, exploding animation and doing it in reverse by reversing the animation and, and then changing the order of things around a little bit. And then I've got a nice exploded view that I created very quickly and easily as well. Now, a lot of these things I personally would probably go in and put a little more polish on if I were doing this in the real world, you know, actual production. You know, my explode lines are not exactly perfect here, but like I said, I did limit myself to only working on this for one hour. So when it hit one hour, I'd save the file and I close. That's why the explode lines are not absolutely perfect here. So um, let's start with uh, the animation here. Now, when I click play, you'll see I've got some. I, I've got a part that rotated. Um, I've got bolts that come off, spin out, and uh, and fade away. I rotate the model to the other side and show the disassembly here. They flash in red, and then uh, this is the point where I would typically put some uh, some notes into the uh, the video. So let's actually go in and let's do that. So let's click on our animation tab. I'm going to check the advanced button here to actually bring up my little animation toolbar here down at the bottom. And it does help to be on a screen with a, a nice resolution. If you're trying to run it at 1024 by 1280, you're going to notice that your your uh, display is not as as accurate as you know it's not as useful as it would, you'd like it to be. Uh, somewhere around the uh, you know 1080p, uh, you know. Uh, resolution worked pretty good for me, you know, 1080 by, uh, you know, 1920 or wh whatever that is. So um, notice here, first of all, I've got my play button. When I click my play button, you'll see my little, uh, my little vertical red line moving through down here. All of the animation elements are down here below, and if you've used uh, most animation type of of tools, you'll notice that um, 
this looks very similar. I'm going to just hold my mouse over the timeline here and scroll the mouse wheel to, to condense it all down so the, uh, the 21 seconds of video can all be seen here. And I can drag this through my assembly and you can see what each of those do. Or I can come down here and drag this through and see the exact same thing. So for every component, for every uh, one of these uh, features, I've, I'm going to do things to it. So let's just look through our animation toolbar here at the beginning. I have at the beginning of my toolbar here, I've got a, a playback loop where I can pick the speed that I play it back. So if I want to analyze something really closely, I can say 0.1x and click play, and you'll notice that it's going to tick through very, very slowly. Um, I can say maybe move it 10x and you'll see everything explodes off real nice and quickly. Set that back to 1. I have the ability to set a range. Right now I'm starting at the beginning, I'm ending at the end. But if I only wanted to go, let's say, from 3 to 10 seconds or from 4 to 7 seconds, I can specify that range here very, very easily. Also, I've got my playback controls button, which turns on and off my playback here. My advanced, that turns on all the advanced animation tools. Under the animations, I can create several animations. I can import existing animations. Um, if I turn on this record content button, notice when I click the button, I get this red dot over here in the top right hand corner of my graphics window that pops in. Just like the old camcorders, when I see the red light, that means I'm recording. So anything I do to the assembly with that red light on will be recorded as part of the animation. So if I just want to play around with something and see how it looks, I will uncheck this box and, and then add some things to the animation and see if I like them, then I will come back and you know delete those things out and and uh, maybe then turn my, my record content back on <coughs> and continue on. Now you're noticing a record camera. One of the really, really cool things about doing animations in Creo Illustrate is I get to record my camera movements separately from um, separately from my my exploding components. So I can put this in a nice you know left, right or top view and create all those exploding views that's nice and easy um, and convenient, then I can come back after the fact and set all those camera positions. So notice how my, my camera is spinning around and it's got this nice little flip here at the end, which um, that's just you know a small mistake that I made there when I was creating the camera positions. And if I expand this out, you'll see I've got all these black diamonds. So every time I hit a black diamond, let's turn this down to, let's say, 0.5 speed and click play. Every time I hit a black diamond, that's going to be a, a camera location. In this case, this black diamond and this black diamond are the same, so everything between those two black diamonds is going to be um, a stationary position. As soon as I hit this one, it's going to start changing from this position to this position. So it's transitioning from this camera position to this camera position. And then again, it's constant between these two. Those are both the same. And then I'm going to move again from here to here. And then you'll notice I'm getting a very slight, slow movement. That's because this one is slightly different than this one. And then I get a nice quick movement because that's a, a large displacement with a, a, a short time between them. And then I'll get another nice real quick flip there at the end. So the really nice thing about this is, like I said, I can record all of my movement positions first and then come back and capture my camera at specific locations. Notice that I do have a couple of notes that I was playing around with that I put in here um, that were, were put in and... Uh, you know, things like um, if, I, if I expand this out and I go back, there was, I had a note put in right here at this position, which is currently hidden out, that said, you know, check gear teeth for, uh, for excessive wear or damage. So you can create those videos where I, I'm exploding something and then I am um, putting service information in. You know, maybe I have, um, let me actually kick over to the other assembly animation here. And let's play this one. So this one, I actually, if you notice, when I expand it out here, you'll notice under my animation tab that it looks relatively similar. You know, all of them, I've got the same pink uh, and purple uh, squares in here, but they're instead of sloping from the top left to the bottom right, they're actually sloping the other way. So all I did to create this one was I came into the original animation, copied it, you know, create, duplicated it, created a copy of it, and then I picked the animation at the top and I clicked reverse and that flipped the entire animation. Notice there, it flipped again. Let me flip it back here. I even have the ability to mirror the animation. So that way, you know, maybe the assembly explodes. I see then, you know, a bunch of bomb balloons pop in and then my assembly, uh, you know, goes back together again. 
but we'll see real quickly. I did change the order. I, I clicked these squares and I dragged them around a little bit, and you'll see again what, what I came up with here. So in this case, I'm starting with an assembly, and I'm having a, a gear pop in here, just magically appear, and they flash in red to indicate where a note might go in, and my screws go in. And let me, let me pause this here, and let's go back for a second. If I were to zoom in on the screw, as I'm moving through this position, you'll notice that, and it's kind of hard because my, my orientation is saved here as well, they're actually screwing in and out. So they're actually twisting as they go in and out. So what I'm applying in this case is what we call effects. So I can pick a component. I can tell it to fly in or fly out along, in, you know, let's say, for example, I pick this component. I pick fly in or out. Um, you know, in the X, Y, or Z direction, plus or minus X, plus or minus Y, or plus or minus Z. I can choose it to fade in or fade out, which is the effect you're seeing uh, in most of these here where it's, it's not there, you know, that's fading in. You know, here's the, uh, an Allen wrench fading in. I also have shake, pulse, and flash. Shake causes something to shake on the screen. Pulse causes it to change in size a little bit. It's, it grows, you know, a few times and shrinks back down. Flash causes it to change color, and I'll show you what flash looks like here in a second. I can actually specify something changed to a certain color. Um, so a, a pin in an assembly changes to red to designate this as an important part of the assembly. And then unscrew. Now, one of the, they did change things with unscrew a little bit in Creo 2. They, uh, we were kind of limited in, in, in Creo uh, Illustrate 1. We were kind of limited on our unscrew capabilities on, on how we could animate those. Now we've got a lot more options. When I pick a bolt and I tell it to unscrew, um, I will then have more options. So let's say, for example, I pick, let's turn our, our record content on, and I pick a component, you know, specific bolt here, and I tell it I want to unscrew. I get a dialog box now. You know, I can pick several bolts and have them all be coupled together and unscrew together. I can pick, you know, which direction it goes. You know, even uh, whether it rotates clockwise or counterclockwise, which I wasn't capable of doing before. So as I'm creating all these elements, let's turn our, our little red light back off so I don't make any changes. Notice there's the flash when I when it comes in here. Let's let's pause this and go back. You'll see that arrow pops in, and I could have I, I decided and I see I've seen several videos out there online of the, uh, the Allen head coming in or the torque wrench coming in and rotating 90 degrees to indicate tightening. Um, in this case, I chose because I'm maybe I'm going to come and split this into several uh, screen captures instead, that I want to come in and have that arrow flash to actually show an arrow instead. So this would be more uh, easily used in, in technical documentation. So as I'm dragging this through, you'll see everything pops back in and everything spins around, just, just like before, only in, in the reverse order, slightly different orders. Now notice, they, I, there's the flashing in red. So I, have, I tell something I want to flash in red. I have things fade in. I have things screw in. You're probably wondering, well, where did that Allen, Allen, head, uh, you know, Allen wrench come in? Because that's not part of the assembly. If I go look here, I will not see an Allen head wrench in here anywhere. Now, I got that from going to my Home tab. Under Symbols, I've got several tools that I can pick from. I've got an Allen key, um, pliers, screwdrivers, torque wrenches, and you know hammers. If I scroll down, you'll notice I have another Allen key, another set of pliers, another screwdriver, torque wrench, and another wrench. Well, the ones at the top here are all three-dimensional, so they're actually a 3D model that I can place into the assembly. The ones at the bottom are all two-dimensional. So these would be more suited for you know something I, I knew was not going to be an animation or a 3D, um, something in 3D. I've also got several signs down below. I've got consumables like oil and glue. Notice this is 2D, this is 3D. There's my arrows down below. Also, I've got stamps I can put in. These are like putting uh, you know little, almost like watermarks and things into, into drawings. There's my explode lines where I can put those in. And annotations, these would include, include my, my bomb balloons or my notes. So I would come in, for example, and let's, uh, let's, turn, let's go back to our animation. Let's turn our record content back on so I can actually add something to the, uh, the assembly here. Let's say right here where I, I flash that location. Or let's do um, when they, they flash in red right here, I might want to have a note that pops in at this location. Let's say right here. I'm going to start from here, 
let's drag this. This is going to determine how long of an event I'm creating. And I'm going to, in this case, go back to my home tab and enter a note. We'll say a note with a leader. And I'm going to start by clicking here and dragging over to here. And I'm going to type in, I want my text to be, um, let's say, ensure uh, gear tooth alignment. And let's say we want it to be a, a rounded rectangle. We want the color to be yellow. And we want the font to be, let's say, 14 point font and click OK. Now notice when we play the video, as this is coming in here, my components come together. And I'm going to have a note pop in right here, ensure gear tooth alignment. Now in this case, I'll have to add in that I want that note to fade out as well. If you notice down here at the bottom, there's my note. So notice the note is moving around with the part, so I would then come in, say for example, let's rewind to right about here. And I want to then take that note and I want to add a, let's see, let's pick the note. And I want that note to fade out at this location. Now when I click play, you'll notice when things come together, my note pops in and then my note will fade out again. So ensure gear tooth alignment and then my note fades away. And then if I want that fade to take longer, then I'll stretch the box so that my, my fade does take longer. If I want it to be shorter, I can, I can do that as well. So maybe my fade takes a little bit longer. But like I said, uh, you'll probably spend a lot more time you know, doing the final, uh, the final tweaks on the, uh, the design than you, of the, the animation than you will actually creating the, the bulk of the animation. So uh, that's animation. Let's go in and let's look at some of these other figures, like this exploded view. Note that um, when I'm under my tools, let's see, figure, home, I have two translation modes, or a translation and a rotation. I also have a restore location, so let's say I'm going to duplicate this, and maybe I'm going to take this copy of it and explode, and let's restore the location, everything back to its factory default positions. Let's uh, turn off this bottom pane here. When I'm moving these uh, explodes, there is also a, um, let's see, under the tools tab, there is a smart explode, but I can manually create my explodes as well. So I can come in and pick translation mode. Let's pick the entire chuck here, and I want to drag this off to a certain distance. Then I want to grab uh, maybe all four of these bolts and drag them to a certain position as well. Notice my uh, explode lines. Drag this to here. Let's drag, let's see, this backside component and this component here. Let's drag both of those back. And let's pick just that gear there and drag this back. And maybe we'll grab this one here and uh, drag him a little bit to the right. And you can see how quickly and easily I can create an exploded view. Now, um, like, like I uh, did mention at the beginning, I've done a lot of this type of work in, in Creo Parametric or in Pro-E and uh, before that, and it's not impossible to do most of this. You know, the animation stuff, we can clearly do a lot more uh, complicated, a lot more advanced things now than we could do before. Um, but as far as exploded views and, and bomb balloons, you know, I want to put in, uh, let's say, for example, I want to go under my uh, item list, and I want to create down here below a, uh, a table. Here's all of my, my components. By clicking that automatic button, it generated this table automatically. Then I want to number everything in the assembly. Let's say I want to say yes, I want to do, I have several different types of callouts I can create. Maybe I want uh, the item number, and I'll see all my item numbers pop in, and I can, I can drag these around. As I rotate my model around, you'll notice that all of my bomb balloons, all my callouts, do face towards the, uh, the screen. <laughs> which is which is nice to have that option, but I could do this before in Pro E, but it was definitely not this quick, this easy. So if you have someone that's doing a lot of technical illustrations, you'll find that uh, uh, the capabilities of the software are very very nice when it comes to the the swiftness of being able to create these things. Um, 
the dynamic cross-sectioning with quarter cuts. You can't do that nearly as fast in Pro-E or Creo Parametric as you can in, in Creo Illustrate. Uh, once I get all of these created, you know, I've got my, my different views and I've got all of my animations. I want to save them or I want to publish them. So if I go to publish, I'll see I have the ability to publish to the uh, Creo View format, so like a, PV, a PVZ file or PVS file, um, where I can then open that this directly in Creo View. Um, I can also come in and instead, let's we'll say, um, instead of publish, um, you know, as a PVZ, maybe I want to instead come in and pick a specific view and I want to save it, you know, save as. And you'll notice here I can save as a, a, an illustration, a C3DI file. I have a couple of those already saved. Um, also, I can, you know, just email it just like you're, you're traditionally used to. I can pick a specific figure and save a figure as a 3D file or as an image. So I can save it as a, uh, a two-dimensional image. We have also now the ability, this is new in Creo 2, the ability to save it um, in an HLR render mode, you know, as an illustration file format. Um, when I, let's say specifically, let's go back to an animation. I've got this animation the way I like it, and it's something that I want to send to somebody else to show them how to assemble my, my parts. Under the animation tab I have an export function where I can take that specific um, movie, in this case 21 seconds long, and I can save it to a specific location. I can choose the type of codec I use to, to uh, generate. In this case I've only got Windows Media codecs installed, but you can install um, other types of codecs as well. How many frames per second, the, the uh, resolution even. And uh, when I create the movie, and I've actually you know, created one already, you'll see that uh, it, it does actually, you know, depending on the, uh, the size and the, uh, the frames per second, it does actually look pretty nice. Um, so one of the things I haven't covered and I'm not going to get into because I don't really have the technical capabilities to, to execute this is um, there is a lot of support for taking this stuff directly into Arbor Text or uh, in ways to take this and publish it uh, directly on your, uh, your website. Um, there is a really nice uh, example that PTC created out there online on, on the PTC webpage that shows how to, uh, you know, that a, a web page that has, you know, uh, a lot of service information. So let's say my, my service guy could pull this up on his iPad while he's out in the field and browse to the website and then spin models around quickly and easily and, uh, and you know, very quickly and easily view uh, assembly and, and disassembly videos with, with bomb balloons popping in and out um, and, you know, notes popping in and out and little notes saying popping in on a video saying torque this you know, bolt to 50 foot pounds or use a screwdriver to flip this, uh, flip open this clip and knock the pin out with a hammer. Um, really nice backhoe example the PTC has on their webpage. Um, at this point, we're right around 12.50. We got through just about everything I was hoping to cover. I want to make sure and leave some time for questions at the end. And I do see that I've got, um, let's see, I see one question. You actually have no uh, okay, questions. Just... There, there are no questions okay. for you. Yep. So uh, if you have a question at this time, um, please feel free to uh, either click the little raise hand button and we can unmute you and you can actually ask me in person. Or if you would prefer, just type it into the questions dialog box at the bottom and I can, I can answer questions. I did see, uh, unfortunately, it's, it looks like we did um, actually lose my audio for a while and I apologize for that. Sometimes that kind of stuff is a little beyond our control. Hopefully it, it made it through to the, uh, the recording when this is posted on YouTube. So let me pull up the last slide here um, if no questions are going to be asked. Um, doesn't look like we're getting any yet. So. If uh, you guys would like to contact me with specific questions afterwards, here's my email address and my cell phone number. Uh, Rosalinda's information is down below. She is the contact specifically, uh, you know, when it comes to things like training. If you're interested in classes or just want to inquire, or you don't see something, or um, we do offer a lot of classes that don't make it onto the schedule regularly. So some of those really, uh, you know, like specifically Creole Illustrate, uh, I'm certified to teach Creole Illustrate. Um, but it doesn't make it under our schedule that often. So if you are interested in taking a, a Creo Illustrate class, um, let us know and we'll, we'll uh, figure out a way to, to get that to you. Okay, so let's see here. I, 
I'm not seeing any questions, so I, if you guys don't have any other questions, if uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up at this. I do appreciate you guys taking the time to, to spend your lunch time or you know some some afternoon time listening to us uh, to chat about some some of the new cool features that we we have in Creo Illustrate. Uh, we will be doing these again every Thursday, so I don't know what what the, the schedule is for next week, but I'm sure it's going to be a good one. Um, there is a question. We do post the. There's oh, one one just popped up. How can you turn on or off hidden lines? Uh, let's see. On or off hidden lines. So let's see. Uh, what could you could you maybe clarify that a little bit? What what type of hidden lines are you referring to? Let me uh, let's see here. Who did who asked that one? Let's can we? James did, and and James, if, them, if, I did unmute him. So if you have a, a microphone, feel free to speak. Okay. <clears throat> um, what I'm, what I was asking, um, I've got like a uh, huge multi-layer um, um, product here, and mm -hmm. whenever I turn it into um, a, uh, what's it called? Uh, I'm not used to the terms in here. Um, an HLR, mm -hmm. um, all the uh, parts underneath are visible through the. Um, do the parts? Is there a way you can turn on and off the underlying parts so you don't see them all? Uh, you know, that's I, I would have to actually take a look at your model. So maybe uh -huh. we'll take this one offline. Let me let me uh, we'll write down your information and I will get with you. Um, you know, soon. Okay. I, it won't be it won't be right this afternoon. I have a meeting right after this one. But uh, okay. Um, if not, I, I have a lot of free time tomorrow, but I will actually get with you personally, and uh, maybe we can do a go-to webinar or something and, and do some screen sharing, and I'll see if I can't help you troubleshoot okay. that. Okay, that would be fabulous, because I'm re relatively new to this, so um, uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's kind of a challenge for me, but I sure. really enjoy this product, so. Yes, yeah, I, I do too. I, I'm, kind of, I'm yeah. kind of bummed I don't get to use it more, because it is, it is a pretty <laughs> fantastic product. Yeah, it's really nice. So, okay, well, thank you, and I will get you my information. You want me just to type it in here? Oh well, yeah. If you would, that'd be fine. Just whatever your most convenient contact information is. We probably already have it, but just to be just to be safe, go ahead and put it in. Type it in the question uh, dialog okay. box, and we'll, uh, we'll get back. All right. Well, if you guys thank don't you. have any other questions, uh, we thank you for your time, and uh, we will see you guys again next week.